Well, g'day everyone and welcome to the Digital Strategy for Small Business Intermediate Webinar. Uh, my name's Adam Penbethy and I'll be your host this afternoon. Um, it's proudly brought to you by the Department of Tourism, Major Events, Small Business and the Commonwealth Games. And I commend the department for their continued support of these, this webinar series. It's a fantastic thing for small business here in, in, in Queensland. Um, today's topic is around how to get your small business to thrive in the digital economy. Um, as mentioned, my name is Adam Penbethy and I am the, uh, the facilitator for this afternoon. Over the last 10 years, we've had vast exposure to the digital sector, um, operating three different businesses in the, digital, in the digital space, either across software development, um, particularly around the mobile application development scenario, right through to digital advertising and strategy. Uh, as well as in a startup context from a uh, particularly mobility perspective. Um, and about 60% of our business now is working with small business, small to medium businesses and helping them undertake that digital transformation journey. Uh, so that's largely kind of the work I guess that we're, we're, we're involved in. Um, so what we're going to cover off today, we've got a lot to cover off so I'm going to go through this reasonably quickly but we'll be covering off a little bit about firstly what is a digital strategy and you know most people actually think a digital strategy is something completely different to what it actually is. So first up we'll, we'll cover off what is a digital strategy. The second part there is we'll, we'll start talking about some of the key trends that you should be thinking about as a small business uh, and some of the solutions that, um, you, that exist to you and, and your business um, as to how you can engage and be engaged in the digital landscape. Um, and, and then the final thing there is we'll look at the auditing process and we'll, we'll look at um, how you can map out the process you need to go through to map out your business, where your business is currently at and obviously the, an action list that exists beyond that. Um, now, ladies and gents, towards the end of the session we'll actually have a, an opportunity for you to ask questions. So if you can hold over any questions until the end of the session, that would be absolutely fantastic. So. First up, what does a digital strategy actually look like? And you could ask 10 different people and can get 10 different answers about what a digital strategy actually is. You know, so many people get confused with the concept of social media strategy or web strategy or online strategy and getting these elements or these ideas, if you like, confused with a digital strategy. And many think because they've got a Facebook page or they give their staff an iPad or they use computers as part of their day-to-day -day work and operation, they've in fact got a digital strategy. But you know, the reality is that this is only just part of what a digital strategy, not the digital strategy. If we look at what a definition is of, of a digital strategy, a digital strategy provides direction on how the business can maximise the benefits of, of digital initiatives in line with the business's vision, goals and opportunities. And if you like, it's almost a, um, a, a direct extension of the, of the business plan, if you like it, in many ways. And if, if you follow my mouse around on the screen for a moment here, you'll see um, the various sectors. So this is a traditional business plan, so you've got the vision, mission, goals, values, and then subsectors, finance, staff, marketing, operations and, and customers. Um, within here, each of the different elements, if you like, of a business plan could contain various digital initiatives. Um, and, and if we take, for instance, just the finance element of a digital plan, you know, the, the opportunities to get digital, so to speak, is endless. Um, you know, digital strategy could be everything from, uh, from a finance perspective, considering moving from a traditional accounting-based solution, think so, solutions like Myob or QuickBooks across to cloud-based solutions like uh, Xero or FreshBooks, and we'll talk about a few of these a little bit later on. Or it might be um, you know, considering taking mobile payments or e-commerce integration. Um, you know, it really, there's a whole heap of different things that could apply, apply to a, a finance perspective of a business plan to help it become more digital. The digital strategy helps take often these quite disjointed elements and brings everything together as to one uh, cohesive strategy. Um, so that, that's what we're kind of, I guess, looking at today in many ways. So I guess with that in mind, let's start our first poll, if that's all right, this afternoon, ladies and gents. I'm going to quickly launch it right now. The, the question is, do you have a digital strategy? Um, now, I've popped this up, and hopefully you see the poll in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, if I can get everyone to keep start voting. Most of you have voted. Wow, some really in interesting statistics. 71% have said no, 29%, 28% have said yes with um, nearly all of you now voting. So, so far, most of the, most of the, the people listening today have, uh, would, would believe that they haven't got a digital strategy in play. Um, I'm just going to quickly close the poll off there. I think everyone's now voted. 
Um, the final figures, quite interesting, 76% have said no, that they haven't got a digital strategy against 24% that have said yes that they have got a digital strategy so very interesting and you know really when we look at this from a um, from a national perspective you know if we if we look at this figure here there's some really interesting statistics and I encourage you to um, maybe at a later point google the uh, Deloitte connected small business study that was done earlier this year Deloitte did this fantastic report on uh, on the level of digital engagement by business particularly small business uh, in Australia and if we work from the bottom up these are some of the findings that they've, they've achieved 35 percent of small businesses have a very low or non-existent uh, do not do not use the internet at all uh, from a digital perspective perspective 24 percent of small businesses uh, have very low digital engagement 25 percent have medium digital engagement and only 16 percent of small businesses are making the most of the web with high digital engagement you know there's some really interesting statistics in there um, if we look at that it's 80 84 percent of the small business population in Australia have kind of a, a medium to, to low um, use of, of digital uh, and, and digital tools and so forth within their business, a low low engagement level. Now really I think you know more than anything this does provide us with an opportunity as a nation to grow and to uh, and, and to be more active if you like from a digital perspective. And so we'll go to a, another quick poll if that's alright ladies and gents and the second question here is how engaged is your business? I'm just going to quickly launch this. So how engaged is your business in the digital economy? So the same thing again, if I can get you to uh, to quickly put where you think your business is currently at, uh, it might be either very low, low, medium or high. Um, and again, some very interesting figures coming in. 17% um, say very low, which is going up and down a little bit. 37% uh, low, 38% medium and 10% high. Um, obviously last week, I'm, I'm going to close that poll off right now and we'll go through it. Last week, last Wednesday, we actually uh, hosted the Introduction to Digital Strategy webinar. Um, today's obviously the Intermediate webinar, so there's, it's, it's, it's interesting to, to see the figures between last week's webinar and obviously this week's webinar. So today, 14% were very low, 36% were low, 39% um, were medium and 11% were high. Uh, from a digital strategy uh, and how engaged their business is in the digital economy. Very interesting stuff. So why do you need a digital strategy? And you need a digital strategy for a whole heap of different reasons. Now there's a lot of research that have gone into understanding best practice businesses who have undergone digital transformation and come out being more pro profitable. You know, if we go back to that Di Deloitte Con Connected Small Business report, um, businesses with higher levels of digital engagement have an average of 20% increase in annual revenue. Uh, and then that second point there, the median revenue for businesses with low digital engagement is 87,500 per employee compared to 187,500 per employee for businesses with high levels of digital engagement. I think you know when you look at these types of figures and this information, it's it's really um, it, it puts a, it, in a good light the reasons why we should be looking at, at in creating a digital strategy and, and moving businesses from traditional forms of communications and, and, and processes to digitally focused businesses, if you like. Um, you know, I think beyond anything, digital and technology can have a ripple effect throughout your business, uh, and in terms of creating efficiencies. And um, you know, a great example of a business which has undergone this digital transformation and come out the other side with increased efficiencies is a, a, a business based here in Brisbane called Trailerproof, um, which make uh, manufacture the, uh, security windows uh, and doors and, and so forth. And um, they export overseas as well as across Australia through to a supplier network. And they've actually their BDMs, their business development managers, are now three times more productive than they were without. Uh, using technology in the business um, and it's been through an online ordering system where their, their clients can now order directly with the business as opposed to having to have to fax in and email in or, or scan in orders or call up one of the account managers or business development managers to, uh, to place an order. So what, it, what they found is that they've, they've found that they've moved their, their BDMs from being order takers to being true business development managers out there in public, in connect, connecting with more businesses, finding more clients and so forth and it's been a very interesting transformation for them, them internally, uh, pushing the, the ordering process back to the customer. Um, so let's look at what makes up a digital strategy and it's much more than a, an IT policy or uh, an online strategy or web strategy, it's much more than just these individual elements if you like. 
you know, a digital strategy from our perspective is made up of nine core elements. And we'll talk through each one of those in detail now. The first one's online presence. So online presence is what your customers see and hear about and read about your business online. So it might be like the, your website, your Facebook page, your mobile website, LinkedIn profiles and so forth. It's the, the things that the customer can interact with, if you like, online. The second point there, digital marketing. And I mean, digital marketing is a bit of a no-brainer. I'm sure you'll, you understand what digital marketing is. Digital marketing is, is the promotion of your business online. So it's using things like Google AdWords or banner ads or microsites or mobile applications and, the, and so forth to, uh, to promote your business online. Um, and then the third point there, selling online. Selling, on, selling goods and services uh, online has become more and more mainstream here in Australia and as well offshore as well, um, whereby customer, people can obviously create an e-commerce based solution, integrate it into their website. Uh, and encourage customers to, to tr perform the transaction, if you like, and via the website as opposed to traditional forms of buying that particular good or service. Um, oh, excuse me, everyone. I've just slipped through the slides here a little bit. Um, the next element in, in, from a digital strategy perspective is the concept of customer interaction. And customer interaction is a really interesting one, and I think one that we'll start to see more uh, emphasis placed on from a digital strategy perspective over time. You know, the, co the concept of customer interaction is connecting with customers online. Um, and th this might be through a whole heap of different things. It might be FAQs, so utilizing like an FAQ type solution on your website or pr providing forums for customers to talk amongst each other or a live chat scenario whereby a customer can go to your website and talk directly to your customer service or sales staff in real time via live chat via your website. Um, or you might do the Telstra model and you might look at moving some of your um, your customer service across to solutions like Facebook or uh, or Twitter whereby customers can ask a question of customer service, of customer support um, directly into these social channels. I think more than anything, you know, we're starting to see efficiencies being generated uh, as a result of going down this path, all of a sudden, you know, customers can start to solve their own um, issues that they might have with a particular product or something they've purchased from your understanding how to, to best use it or whatever it might be, rather than going online and, and utilizing an online forum or an FAQ type section of a website as opposed to calling up to your customer service staff and asking your customer service staff those same questions. The next point there, online security. And online security, again, is a, a bit of a, um, a broad brush in many ways, and it, and it means a whole heap of different things to a whole heap of different people. But online security largely is, is, is data backups, whether it be on-site or off-site, as well as policies. And it might be policies, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on today, but policies around the use of your own device. So for instance, if staff are bringing their own mobile phone or their own laptop and utilizing their own mobile phone and laptop at work, um, having creating policies around the best practice and use for that, as well as policies around the use of company information and data and so forth. And then the, the next point there, the, the fourth last one is supplier interaction. And supplier interaction is quite an interesting one as well. And we're starting to see a progression towards businesses using cloud-based accounting software and uh, enterprise resource management software, ERPs. Um, it within their business and there's a lot of benefits that can come from utilizing these new digital tools uh, from a supplier interaction perspective. It might be that um, stock is automatically reordered uh, based on past sales history and past sales flows um, and demands over the last you know, three, six, twelve, or or even you know that time in the year before or the year before that. Those types of solutions, um, as well as capturing feedback from customers, so the end user of a particular product, and passing that back to suppliers as well. The, uh, the third last one, they're mobile-based solutions. And again, there's a whole heap of different opportunities that come from the use of mobility within businesses. Um, and, and it might be that a business might consider creating a custom mobile application available publicly via iTunes or Google and Android, um, Google Play for Android, uh, or the Windows market and so forth. Um, or it might be creating a mobile website even, or it might even just be creating a, a custom mobile application that sits within the business and it's used by internal sales staff uh, and not publicly available via one of the app stores. And we'll talk about mobile mobility a little bit later on this afternoon as well. Um, the second last point, there are efficiencies through technology and, and efficiencies, I think this is actually one of the key things and we'll, I'll, I will talk a lot about efficiencies today, but you know, one of the things that technology does bring is it, it can uh, create certain levels of efficiencies within uh, a business. It might be utilizing a custom mobile application to replace internal mundane business process processes or you know, using automated marketing solutions to better communicate and connect with customers 
giving them information that they need when they need it uh, on demand and so forth. And then that last point there, and we will talk about cloud actually, we'll talk about cloud just shortly, cloud computing. And that could either be as, from a software as a service type solution where you, you pay for the use of a software package um, and, and use it via the internet, or it might be infrastructure as a service where you're physically connecting to a remote server as opposed to connecting to a server um, in real time uh, it, it, via the, the um, in the office as such. So what are some of the things that you should keep on the horizon? There's a whole heap of elements and we'll talk through um, based on di the digital strategy and, and the nine elements that I referred to before, we'll talk through a couple of the key um, areas if you like within the digital strategy um, and, and we'll talk in a little bit more specific detail about it. So let's quickly start off with cloud computing. Cloud computing is a really interesting one. You know, cloud computing can be one of two things, or actually three things, but we'll, we'll cover two of them this afternoon. It could be infrastructure as a service or software as a service. Infrastructure as, of, as a service is, is quite an interesting concept. What it is is it's um, the, the conversion or the removal of uh, physical uh, server infrastructure and infrastructure in your actual office itself. You might have a server currently in a cupboard or in a cabinet in your office and removing that and placing that or in, a, in a cloud or in, in, uh, via the internet. So rather than your staff connecting to a server locally, you connect to the server via the internet. And then rather than having physical computers you might use laptops or you might even just have a monitor sitting on your desk with a keyboard and mouse and a microcomputer strapped to the back of it that is actually connected to a supercomputer connected via the internet. Now with the internet speeds now becoming so, um, you know, quite high and obviously readily available as well, um, the ability to have access to fast internet is becoming more and more quite a reality for small businesses. Um, and one of the benefits of moving from an infrastructure as a, to, as a service solution where, rather than having fixed infrastructure in your office is the, the capex, the reduction in capex spend. So that, that capital expenditure that you spend on buying servers, on um, so, uh, software licensing, on buying computers and so forth, moving it to an operational expenditure. You know, one of the benefits of cloud in general is, is that you typically have access to hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of hardware. Um, all for a monthly fee per employee, which gives you a, a certain level of scalability um, where you can increase your level of infrastructure or decrease your level of infrastructure based on the ebbs and flows, if you like, of a, of a traditional business. And then the other side of cloud computing is the concept of service, software as a service. And this is probably one that you would have heard of uh, maybe a little bit more, more readily. And it's things like utilizing a software program via the internet rather than having that physical software physically installed in the machine. Um, you know, it, all the data in this type of scenario sits in a virtual online server, uh, again, not locally on the machine, which mitigates the risk of lost data if the computer's stolen or the computer dies or the server dies, those types of scenarios. Um, and and to, in this scenario, the data is accessed then across various machines as well. So rather than having, if you have two computers, one at home, one at work, you can access that same piece of software via the internet, via either computer. And you, you might have heard of some, some kind of core um, cloud-based software as a service solutions, things like Salesforce or Xero, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're quite prominent um, cloud-based solutions that are, that are currently on offer to businesses. Um, but like everything in, you know, in, in technology, there's, there's pros and, and, and it falls and against and benefits and weaknesses of all these different types of environments. You know, some of the benefits of, of cloud computing is that it's 99% safe and there's typically uptime guarantees that the service provider provides you as a client. Um, and as I said before, you know, from an infrastructure perspective, you typically get hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of infrastructure, in some cases millions of dollars worth of infrastructure and software and security processes all from monthly fee per employee or per user that's using it. Um, and, and then the other side of this, as we mentioned before, is that it can be scalable. And it can be scalable in the sense that if your business is um, contractual and you go from project to project, you can scale up with staff numbers and, and scale up your technology requirements and then scale it back down in, in the quiet periods. Um, so you're not having to have, to roll, have uh, these large or could potentially large overheads uh, and costs constantly. And then that last point there is quite important. You know, in many of these instances, the software, the, the services provided are remote. They're not currently, they're not constantly in your office. So you, you don't actually have to have someone physically there to maintain the solution and so forth. But beyond all this, again, you know, like everything, there's weaknesses as well. So 
it doesn't work for all business types. You know, or some business models um, may not actually work well in a cloud-based environment. In some cases, you lose direct control of the infrastructure as well. And if you've got an internal IT team, sometimes that can be the concern from them. They, they don't have that physical direct control over the infrastructure. Um, the third point there, try to ensure that your data stays in Australia and not in an offshore facility. You know, there's plenty of um, different types of so services and solutions out there. You, know, you might want to consider utilising a solution and a service where it is local as opposed to having your data sitting in an offshore facility. Um, and then make sure your cloud solution that you're actually getting is the right fit for your business. And this is a really important one. You know, cloud has become a marketing buzzword and, and you could refer to cloud in a whole heap of different ways. Um, make sure the service that you're getting, the cloud solution that you're getting is the right one for your business. It's a really important point. So if we move on then to online selling, and online selling is a huge opportunity for some businesses. You know, the first point there, mobile commerce, 24% of Australians are making purchases via mobile commerce. And this means that they're physically logging in to your e-commerce store via their mobile phone and purchasing via your e-commerce store uh, over their phone in real time and, and doing that transaction as opposed to logging in via their computer. I think a really good example of a business that's doing mobile commerce exceptionally well in this country is Domino's. Um, and I, I know there's probably uh, no businesses the size of Domino's um, tuned in this afternoon, but you know they're experiencing some incredible results from a mobile commerce perspective. You know, 50% of all their sales now comes from one of their online resources, whether it be their website, whether it be their Facebook page, or their mobile website, or the mobile application. And 40% of all their online sales now comes from a, a mobile phone. So this is customers physically logging into the, the website or utilizing the Domino's Pizza mobile application to, to buy a pizza, to, 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 um, to order a pizza and have it delivered or to go and pick it up and so forth. And then we're starting to see some really interesting marketing solutions as well around mobile commerce. You know, there's a, a website in Australia called ozsale.com.au and they actually uh, encourage customers to use mobile commerce first and foremost as opposed to uh, their website. So in, in their instance, they actually open up their sales uh, an hour earlier on mobile commerce than they do on the web commerce to encourage customers to use the mobile phone to purchase. I think you know, almost at a minimum, if you currently do sell online or you've got an e-commerce framework that you're looking at setting up, make sure it's mobile friendly. Make sure that when a customer goes to your, um, to your website, you know, they have got access to it. They can utilize your, your, your mobile commerce uh, solution efficiently. And then that second point there, Facebook commerce, and F-commerce as it's kind of commonly referred to, is essentially embedding your e-commerce solution into Facebook, um, whereby the customer can then buy and then share what they've bought via Facebook it, without leaving the Facebook platform. They can do it all within the, the, the utility itself. One of the key benefits for this is for those the businesses that are selling you know, fast-moving consumer goods or um, you know, scenario, uh, solutions like um, clothing and uh, those types of purchases, things that you want to encourage customers to share what they're purchasing with their friends in real time. Um, F-commerce or Facebook commerce is a really interesting concept and it's something which is um, going exceptionally well overseas. Um, and then you know, beyond all of this, the, the concept of B2B efficiencies, and we'll talk a little bit further about this a little bit later on this afternoon, but you know, so, many pe so many times people think that e-commerce is purely B2C, business to, to consumer. Um, but you know, in more, more cases than not, you can actually create significant B2B or business to business type arrangements. And I told you about Prowler Proof before and what they're doing. All their customers now transact via the, the e-commerce or the, the, the commerce solution, the ordering platform that they've created within their website as well as within the desktop platform that they've created. Um, all their customers transact through that as opposed to faxing in or calling in orders uh, to, to the business to, um, to process. So there's a lot of efficiencies that can be created within the business by getting the customers to order online as opposed to calling up directly. So some of the benefits of online selling, well firstly the ability to trade 24-7. You know, this is a bit of a no-brainer. All of a sudden, you know, it doesn't matter if customers are ordering their groceries on at 11 o'clock at night or midnight or 2 o'clock in the morning. They might be transacting and buying from you. And then the second point there, you know, the ability to trade across geographic borders. Um, and, and, you know, I think one of the, the core opportunities here is Australia and, and particularly Queensland's proximity to Asia. You know, all of a sudden, you might even consider uh, releasing a version of your website in, in various languages. You might release your website in Mandarin uh, to promote 
and to, uh, to, to sell to a, a, a Chinese market, for instance. Um, and in some cases, it's a highly convenient sales channel. More and more Australians and, and people around the world are being conditioned to buy online and are used to buying online. So it's, it's become very, very convenient, very, very easy and very much part of the day-to-day -day norm of doing business. And then that last point there, it can be a very a highly effective, uh, cost-effective sorry, channel as well. But again, like everything, there's some weaknesses it might be. And you know, in some cases, the shipping costs might preclude some businesses from selling online. So you just need to kind of, I guess, weigh that up in the, in the products that you're selling. You might sell a, um, a, a vehicle suspension, for instance, something which is, would be very expensive to sell and to, to ship um, anywhere in Australia, particularly by uh, surface mail. Um, and in, in that case, you might actually uh, sell augmented products via your e-commerce solution. So you might sell um, you know, add-on purchases and, and uh, customer-focused customer, customer -focused purchases to extend the life of the, the suspension that they're purchasing from, you, from your business. And then the second point there, you know, like anything, like any new sales channel, that you need to wrap a whole of business solution around it. If you were to go and open up a new retail store tomorrow, you'd be thinking about marketing, you'd be thinking about resources, you'd be thinking about um, reordering and, and, and how you're going to deal with stock coming back to you and so forth, returns. Um, it, like any any sales channel, you need to ensure that all these things have been taken into consideration for an e-commerce store as well. You can't go in there and not market it. You can't go in there and not resource it properly from a staffing perspective and so forth. All these things need to be taken into consideration. And then the second last point, you know, and this is becoming more and more applicable, the pricing model can sometimes differ from a, a traditional bricks and mortar type environment. You know, maybe your online sales environment, um, you might have a, a slightly different pricing structure, a slightly different pricing model uh, around the way in which you engage, the way in which you sell online. Um, and then that last point there, dealing with returns and client issues and so forth, like any channel, whether it be a retail store, whether it be a wholesale store or, or you know, whatever, uh, you need to have a process and a mechanism in place to be able to deal with returns and client issues and so forth. So let's quickly go to our third poll this afternoon, ladies and gents, um, and I'm just going to open this one up quickly right now. Um, this is actually a two-part two poll. The first part of the question is, are you currently selling online? Um, so this is, are you currently utilising an e-commerce based platform to sell online and, and the, the votes are coming in fast and furious here. Predominantly, what is it, 73, 74% have said no, 27% have said yes, 26% have said yes. Um, I'm going to pull this up just quickly right now. Um, most have voted and let's close that off just quickly now. So that was quite interesting. 70% said no, they don't have an e-commerce platform uh, and 30% said yes, they do. So the second part of this is for those that just answered no. You know, if you're not selling online, could you potentially, okay? And you've got three answers there, yes, no, or unsure. So quite a few unsures in there. Predominantly yeses though, 48, 47% yeses. 50% yes, 51% yes. I'll just give it a couple more seconds to capture all the votes. And let's close that one off now, if that's all right, ladies and gents. So that was really interesting. So of the people that said no, they're not currently selling online, 53% said yes, they could possibly sell online, 20% said no, and 27% said unsure. So happy to talk to those that are unsure a little bit later on, maybe through the question and answer section. And we can, uh, we can talk about um, you know, ways in which you might be able to utilise an online selling based framework as such. Let's progress on, ladies and gents. So the, the next section that I wanted to talk about is digital marketing. And digital marketing, as, as the name kind of suggests, is, is, um, is pr the promotion of your business online, as we talked about before. And one other thing which just constantly astonishes me is that businesses don't have a CRM, a customer relationship management tool. Um, you know, more often than not, you'll speak to a business owner or a business manager and their, their CRM, their customer relationship data, is their accounting software or an Excel spreadsheet. Um, you know, one of the benefits of a CRM is it allows your sales staff and, and your internal management team to be able to capture customer information and then share that information with all the, the rest of the staff in real time via a CRM tool. Um, and more and more, these CRM tools, like for instance Salesforce or Hi-Rise HQ, 
provide mobile versions of the CRM, which means that you could download the mobile application onto your mobile phone and your sales staff could, could move around capturing customer information on their iPhone or their iPad or their Android phone um, rather than keeping handwritten customer cards in the boot of their car um, you know, and so they could move to an iPad-based solution. Um, you know, CRM is, is, is really an underutilized resource uh, here in this country and, and, and across the world and something that should really be considered a little bit further. Um, the second point, they're investigating remarketing solutions and I won't go into the specifics of remarketing this afternoon. I'll talk quite broadly about it but would encourage you to quickly jot it down and, and do some Google searches a little bit later on about marketing automation and re remarketing. It really is a huge buzzword. What it allows you to do is create cookie cutter campaigns that take a prospect from uh, through a predefined series of emails and communications which is altered based on what they're selecting and clicking on in the email and on your website. So for instance, you might a customer might inquire via your website or they might download a free white paper or um, a free handbook on how to use a particular product that you sell. And then what you might do is you might have a series of trigger-based emails that go out over the next three or six months or two weeks, whatever it is, um, that walks that customer from uh, the initial engagement to, to being a nurtured lead to then prioritizing the lead and then hopefully getting them into a sales type environment. And then, you know, through digital marketing, there's a whole heap of opportunities that come from it. Everything from Google AdWords, and we won't go into the specifics of Google AdWords this afternoon, but Google AdWords, social media advertising like Facebook ads and the like, um, creating and sending email newsletters and email marketing. Uh, you know, these are all elements that make up uh, digital marketing. And, but one of the things that you really need to consider from a digital marketing perspective is the ability to be able to understand how your customers are getting to your site. What are they typing in Google or what are they typing in Yahoo to get to your website? I think, you know, this is one of the things that really business owners and, and marketing people need to think about is what is a customer doing to, and how are they getting to our website? And then almost re-engineering that process to ensure that your website and your, your ads are at each of those different touch points all the way along. Um, and, and I mean obviously Google AdWords is, is great at being able to do that and one of the, the tools behind Google AdWords is the concept of Google Analytics um, which means that you can then track quite efficiently what a customer is seeing and what they're clicking on prior com to coming to your website and then after going to, after your website as well um, and, and as well as looking at solutions whereby understanding whether a customer has transacted, if they've clicked on a Google AdWord maybe that you're running uh, and then transacted on your website as well and, and really understanding the true ROI as such to your business. So some of the benefits of digital marketing. You can segment the demographic really, really well to ensure that the cut through is achieved to a very, very specific group of people. I think you know one of the things with digital marketing is the ability to be able to run highly targeted and highly segmented campaigns um, to communicate with with very very specific and niche customers in many many ways, um, you know through Google AdWords for instance, you can target very very specific search terms. So anyone that's typing in a, a specific search that's relevant to your business may come across one of your ads. Um, and the second point there, you know, in some ways it can be a very highly cost effective channel um, and can generate quite a strong return on investment as well if done correctly. Um, and then that last point there, the ability to be able to test and measure is really really uh, positive and, and, and there's huge opportunities there. You can run two separate ads on Google for instance or on Facebook advertising or LinkedIn advertising. You can run two of the same ads in different written in different ways side by side simultaneously and see which ad has a better return on investment, which ad uh, is encouraging more customers to go through to the website. But again, like everything, you know, there's weaknesses associated with um, with online selling as well. You know, sometimes the shipping costs can preclude um, bit, oh, sorry. I've clicked through the wrong slide, I'm sorry. Um, there's there's uh, some of the weaknesses for digital marketing. Often it's very niche, you know, and, and mass media is, uh, is, is something that digital marketing uh, isn't really applicable for, if you like, you know, the ability to be able to go and connect and communicate your message with a whole heap of people in real time um, it isn't something that you can do efficiently via digital marketing and have a good return on investment. You know, quite often it's reliant on human resources and time as opposed to money, which is traditional advertising, traditional marketing would kind of rely on. You know, you can go and spend two hundred thousand dollars on an outdoor billboard campaign and uh, and broadcast your message to millions and hundreds of thousands of people. 
uh, online, you probably won't spend two hundred thousand dollars, but you can get specific, very very specific and niche cut through to very very specific people who have a, a high propensity to to buy from you. And then that last point there, you know, the digital space is is quite cluttered and also quite messy in the sense that you know everyone is just one click away from your website or one click away from leaving your website as well in many instances. So. That kind of brings us to the next point as well, which is bring your own device. And this kind of comes back to more of a security perspective. Um, I, I'm not sure if anyone's using uh, BYOD, but the concept of bring your own device is, is rapidly gaining momentum, whereby staff use their personal smartphones and laptops as part of their day-to-day -day work and if, for your job. Um, as a, so they're actually using their smartphones and actually using their laptops for work, at work as such. Um, and you know, it's, there's some really inst interesting statistics. 50% of staff are prepared to use their own devices that they've purchased themselves at work for work. Um, and there's lots of benefits, but there's also lots of weaknesses for BYOD and the BYOD concept. You know, one of the benefits from a business perspective is that you typically would have access to the latest technology. You know, a, a, a consumer customer, uh, an employee is more likely to turn over their technology more frequently as opposed to a business which would possibly hold on to a computer or their mobile uh, um, phones and so forth for longer periods of time before they, they transition it over to a new machine and so forth. Um, but you know, by the same token with this, what happens to any customer data saved on the device if the device is stolen or the device is lost? One of the key benefits though of, of, uh, of BYOD, um, which we'll talk about in a moment, is the reduction in um, capex and capital expenditure by the business. No longer does it, the business need to supply a laptop or a mobile phone as part of the package to the employee. Um, you, know, you can utilize that or package that up into the employee's benefits itself. And then that last, and the last point, you know, consider policies um, around the use of uh, BYOD and, and, and how it's been used in business, particularly to ensure that data isn't lost in the event that the personal equipment dies or is stolen, for instance. So some of the benefits, again, typically you get access to the latest technology, which we talked about before. Um, again, reduced capex on, on IT equipment. You know, if, if customers, if the staff are supplying their own devices, it means that you as a business owner doesn't, don't need to necessarily buy them the equipment. And then the last point, you know, work anywhere, anytime. Um, staff can, can work efficiently remotely because they're used to and familiar with the product that they're using. But then again, some of the, weak, the weaknesses, you really need to have a strong BYOD policy outlining acceptable use within the business. Um, and, you, and you might actually, you might save some money from a CapEx perspective, but you might actually start spend a little bit more money from an upgraded security solution perspective. Um, you, might, you might have to create all of a sudden some off-site secure uh, usage um, solutions to mitigate lost and stolen equipment, for instance, um, and, and potentially the distraction of, of, for staff on personal tasks while they're at work. Um, and then that last point there, who pays for it when it breaks is the, the, the final point. So. On your business, do you, do you use, do you allow staff to use their personal devices at work for work? I'm just going to open this poll quickly right now and I'd love to hear your opinion on it. Um, that should be popping up right now. So the question is, do you allow your staff to use their personal devices at work for work? Um, and most people are saying yes, they currently do. I'll just um, give it a couple more seconds. 56% say yes so far, 44% say no. And I'm just going to close this one off now quickly, guys. <clears throat> so 56% say 56% say yes, 44% say no, that they don't allow their staff to use um, their, their own personal devices at work, for work. And then the second part of this question is, if yes, do you have a, a policy around the use of their own, their own devices at work? Uh, the questions, the responses again is yes, no, and unsure. Um, and to be expected, the majority so far have said no. I'll give you a couple more seconds. A couple of people saying not sure. Um, maybe two or three more seconds. And let's pull that up quickly right now. So 68% said no, they don't have a policy around the use of, of equipment at work against 25% that say said yes, that they do have a policy around the use of personal equipment at work. Um, you know, certainly for those that haven't, uh, that do allow their staff to bring and use their own devices at work for work, um, it, it really is something that you should consider creating policies around best use and, and how to efficiently and effectively use their devices at work. 
to ensure that particularly data isn't lost in the event of a crisis or event of stolen equipment or lost equipment. So let's move on. And we talked earlier on about uh, cloud infrastructure and, and broadly about, about cloud software. But I thought I'd talk a little bit more succinctly about cloud software particularly. Um, you know, cloud, cloud software comes in a whole heap of shapes and sizes um, and there's a whole heap of different platforms to do a whole heap of different things. So for instance, you can use cloud applications like Podio or Basecamp among others for project management. You can use tools like Harvest for time tracking. You can use tools like Salesforce or Highrise HQ for CRM, customer relationship management. You could use tools like Dropbox or Box.net for file sharing. And you might use Xero or FreshBooks uh, and many more for accounting uh, and so forth. And, and the list kind of goes on. There's literally hundreds of thousands of cloud applications that serve all sorts of purposes and so forth. But one of the benefits of, of looking at cloud solutions is typically what, they, what the provider, what the software provider offers the user is the ability to be able to use the API and the API stands for Application Programming Interface. And what it basically means is it means that when you subscribe to say for instance Salesforce or you subscribe to Xero for an account as an accounting solution, you have access to the development tools and the development portals which means that your web developers might be able to create custom solutions that interface with these, these third party cloud applications and cloud tools. Um, and, and can create them in different ways to benefit your business. So for instance, on your website, you might have data automatically being captured, um, so in client inquiries or prospect inquiries via the website being automatically captured and then shared directly to your CRM for future follow-up and so forth. But one of the other benefits of all of this is with all these data points that would be coming in through these the, the APIs that are available and, and, and uh, applicable to these various tools, is you can start to create some really interesting data visualizations. So the, the point might be that your staff might be using, um, say for instance, a uh, cloud-based accounting solution and they might be outbound and, and seeing customers creating estimates using zero on their iPad. Um, as a business owner, you might create an internal dashboard that shows you the value of each of those estimates so you can get a really clear understanding as to what your pipeline value might be over the next two, three, six weeks um, or six months even, you know, potentially depending on how long your sales cycles are. And then, you know, th that same point, kind of point ties directly into cloud-based solutions and there's a whole heap of different cloud-based solutions on the market for businesses. But one of the, one of the benefits of cloud-based solutions is it, it allows you to connect directly with your bank account for automatic bank reconciliation. So half of your reconciliation can actually be done um, before you even log into your accounting software, which is quite positive. Another one of the benefits of, of these types of solutions, as I alluded to just before, is that you can actually create invoices and track expenses via your mobile phone and, and, and tablets and so forth. So you can download the product directly onto your iPhone, for instance, or your Android phone, and utilize your, your iPhone or Android phone to be able to create invoices on the run uh, and track expenses and so forth. Um, and there's some really cool advantages here for, for various businesses. Say, for instance, you run a team of electrical contractors and whereby it, it, potentially the solution might be where you, you give the staff, your, electric, your electricians, a mobile phone or they use their own mobile phone, their iPhone or Android phone, and whilst they're out in the field s speaking with, with customers and doing service calls and so forth, they can create estimates or cre create invoices directly into your accounting software rather than calling up to back to the office and getting the admin person to be able to type in uh, into a core accounting software and so forth. You can automate those processes and create efficiencies in your business um, through the use of uh, these types of tools as such. And then the last point there, you know, the movement of cloud point of sale. Um, and cloud point of sale is essentially utilizing an iPad as a replacement to a traditional point of sale system. Um, and there's again some really interesting um, real-time data that can be drawn from it. A good friend of mine, for instance, runs a, uh, a business here in Brisbane, a retail business here in Brisbane, um, and has another business in Los Angeles and spends half of his time in Los Angeles. And what he finds is he can log in whilst he's having breakfast in LA and see how his business is trading back in Australia in real time via his iPad and change the pricing mixes and pricing models and so forth in real time in the store back here in Brisbane um, using his, his iPhone or his Android phone. And again, like everything, you know, there's, there's fors and against for cloud software. You know, one of the, some of the benefits is that it gives you real time online access anywhere, anytime, like in the example that I shared with you of my friend that can access his, his retail store figures 
um, from from abroad or from anywhere he might be. Um, in some cases, it's quite affordable as well. One of the benefits of cloud solutions is you're not physically buying the software in one lump sum. Most likely, you'll be paying that for that software on a monthly per employee basis, as opposed to uh, buying and purchasing that piece of software in one one large sum as such. As such. And then you know the other side of it is it's quite scalable. So again, if depending on how your business, uh, the fluctuations of your internal business, you might increase or decrease the level of numbers of users that you might be, have and subscriptions you might have to the software um, based on these these market fluctuations. And then the last point there, you know, again, the ability to be able to extend or modify or even link two or more cloud applications together using the API and the developer tools can be a really good attraction to uh, to some businesses. But again, like everything, there's weaknesses. Um, and one of the weaknesses is you don't physically own the software. Like when you buy a piece of software and it becomes an asset of your business, um, typically in cloud type solutions and scenarios, you'll, you're, you're essentially paying a license fee to have access to that software. And then the second point there is, you know, whilst the, 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 the cloud software solution provider will say that they have very few and, mo and, and, um, and low levels of downtime, you know, you, there may be out server outages or upgrades that may affect your business's productivity and access to some of these solutions. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the, the third point there, that data is typically stored abroad as well. And this kind of means that um, rather than, because most of the manufacturers for these large cloud applications, which is commonly used by business today, are in America or in Europe and so forth, Typically, the data would be stored in those countries as well. Um, the second last point there, you know, the cost can be high for uh, cloud solutions and cloud software, particularly if you have hundreds of thousands or thousands of staff and people accessing it, uh, and you're paying a monthly per person fee. It sometimes can work out quite expensive to go down this path, and then support can sometimes be lower as well for uh, for cloud solutions. The next point that I wanted to talk to you about was mobility, and mobility is one of the fastest growing sectors. Uh, available to us right now. Uh, mobility refers to the ability to be able to use tablet devices and smartphones and, and the like for productivity gains and business improvements. So we talked about a little bit before uh, the, the ability to be able to access your cloud applications via smartphones. So I won't go into much more detail about that. We also talked a little bit about mobile commerce from the perspective that users can, can transact and buy you through your mobile phone. One thing I didn't talk about was um, the another side of mobile commerce which allows you to turn your device into a mobile FPOS machine. So if you just see where my mouse is on the screen at the moment, this bottom image here is an example of PayPal's Hello, uh, sorry, Pay, PayPal's Here solution which is essentially turns your mobile phone into a mobile FPOS machine. Um, Commonwealth Bank has released a product called Pi and Leo, um, which is exactly the same. It's, a, it's essentially a uh, solution which clicks onto your mobile phone and turns your mobile phone into a mobile FPOS machine. And if we go back to the example of an electrician, um, some of the benefits of, of, of this type of scenario would be the electrician could utilize, for instance, Xero, which is an, a cloud-based accounting solution. They might use Xero, the application on their mobile phone, to create an invoice and then use a, a PayPal here or Commonwealth Bank Pi type solution to be able to swipe the credit card uh, of the customer right there and then to collect that transaction, as opposed to calling back to the head office getting the head office to type up the invoice, telling them the, the various products and parts that we use as part of that service call, um, getting the, the admin staff to be able to send out the invoice to the customer, then the admin staff having to have to follow up the customer to chase payment and so forth. Um, you know, you can avoid these types of solutions and f have that entire transaction facilitated in one easy, um, swift process all in the same time. And then the other side of mobility is the ability to be able to create custom applications that exist on the, on the mobile phone. Um, and custom applications are, are, are similar to a, like what you would do on your computer. You would install a, uh, a piece of software on your computer. The same thing kind of applies where you can install an application onto your mobile phone. So it's like physically installing a piece of software onto your computer. Um, and, and it might be one of two ways. You might create external applications, which are applications which go to the App Store like iTunes or Google Play for Android devices, um, or you might even consider creating internal applications, and internal applications are applications that only exist on, say, 6 or 10 or 12 iPads or iPhones, which are used by managers um, or, or staff within the business, and the, ex the internal applications might be 
business process based applications. So for instance, you might have an outbound sales team that currently use duplicate or triplicate paper to collect notes on customers and take orders and, and inquiries and so forth. You might be able to expedite this process by utilising a custom mobile solution. And there's plenty of good examples of businesses that have created these mobile solutions to really add value to the experience that a customer has with a product. Um, Coroma, the, uh, the, the manufacturer, has a, is a really good example of that. They, they provide an application for plumbers and uh, DIY home handymen to be able to um, download and see in real-time installation instructions for all the different things that they offer, all the different parts and products that they offer. And it um, allows them to quickly and easily see you know, things that they can, the product codes, the features and the benefits, installation tips and so forth, all via a mobile application, an iPhone, an iPad and the like. Um, so some of the benefits and weaknesses of, of mobility, you know, the benefits, it's always on, you've got, accessible, you've got access to information anywhere, anytime, um, which is one of the key things with, with mobility. Um, you can leverage off the handset's core functionality. So for instance, you might use uh, the GPS feature, for instance, within the, within the actual handset itself. Uh, and, and you might create a custom application if you had a set of sales staff, and I hope there's no sales staff listening to me today, but um, you might even create a, a custom application for your sales staff where they can automate some of their processes via the iPad and collect the GPS data to be able to see where your sales staff are at on a actual Google map, for instance, that type of scenario. So you can tell whether, you, whether your sales staff are uh, spending too much time in coffee shops or whether they're spending a little bit too much time at one particular customer's and, and so forth. Um, and, and then you know, the, other, the third point there, the device is typically always with the user. One of the key benefits of, uh, of, of mobility is that you know, mo we're most likely to walk around and take our mobile phone wherever we go. And then that last point there, you know, we're almost at market saturation now where most um, most people do have the, have a mobile phone here in Australia, particularly if we look at some place, parts within Asia, and we actually see two to three mobile phones per, per users in some cases. Um, but then again, weaknesses, you know, developing, if you're developing or considering developing mobile applications, um, developing mobile applications that exist across a whole heap of different operating systems can sometimes be quite expensive. And, uh, and, and then again, you know, because the platforms are constantly changing, Apple will release a new product or uh, Android releases an upgrade and so forth. Because that happens, quite often the, uh, the, the, the application needs to be updated as well in, uh, with, in line with the upgrades of the software. And then that last point there, because the, the, the physical size of the screen is quite small, there's some things that you can't do efficiently on a, uh, on, an, on, a, on a mobile phone or an iPad, for instance. So let's just run to the end of the, of the session now. Um, the, the last little bit that I wanted to talk to you about is, is the process of auditing your business. And the Department of Tourism, Major Events, Small Business and the Commonwealth Games have created this really great framework for a small business to understand and, and audit their business. It's called the Small Business Digital Readiness Tool. And if you uh, have, have downloaded already the, uh, the workbook that accompanies today's webinar, um, you'll see it towards the end of the, of the, of the book. But some of the, the tool really quickly enables you to be able to understand where your business is currently at, whether you're at and if you look up at the screen just briefly you might be at a, a, a beginner at a surviving stage or you might be at a consolidating stage or an advanced stage a leading stage through the various areas of the digital strategy so online presence digital marketing customer interaction supplier interaction and you might you might have currently a, uh, a standard website like a generic brochure style website um, and then you can quickly and quite easily see that in order for you to progress to a consolidating level so the uh, a digital a, a, a basic website would be a beginner or a surviving characteristic um, a consolidating or a digitally active characteristic would be taking customer orders so creating an e-commerce solution or processing payments online or creating updates to your website uh, on a regular basis and you can quite easily then tick the boxes which are applicable to each of the different areas of the uh, of the digital audit, and then the other side, and again you'll see this in the workbook, is the action plan. And the action plan allows you to, to kind of go through each of the elements of the digital audit and understand the steps that you need to do to progress further forward. So once you've done the audit, you might want to then go and research um, the options that are available to you and. You might consider uh, looking at other people that operate in a similar sector or in the same sector to you that are doing exceptionally well in this digital space. Um, and, and then you will obviously want to create an action plan. And the action plan would be a list of desired steps that you'd need to go through to reach that end goal. 
And then the last point there, define. And define is really understanding what success would look like. So how will you be able to determine when you're successful at this particular implementation? And it might be, uh, if we go back to the website example, going from a brochure website to an e-commerce based website, your, your uh, de definition of success might be to $1,000 worth of sales a week uh, in, in online, uh, on average sales via your online store. So if we just quickly go through a quick summary of what we've gone through today, digital strategy is more than just social media. It's more than just having a website. It's more than just bu buying staff iPads. You know, a digital strategy is an integral part of your business plan. And, and I think if you go back to that initial image um, that we created that shows the various makeup of a business plan and, and look at those different areas and, and opportunities that exist within each of the sub areas of a business plan, um, it, it would be very important. It would be interesting to then go and compare that back to your business plan and look, and look at your business plan and look at each of the areas of your business plan and assess how you can uh, achieve some efficiency gains through the use of technology and software. And that, that fourth point there, consider the benefits that come from cloud computing, selling online, and maybe it might be B2B as, as opposed to B2C, for instance, as well, selling direct to your customers via an online channel as opposed to, 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 to uh, end users. Um, and then the consideration of, of mobile commerce as well. The, the fourth last point there, look at efficiency gains that might come from moving to a mobile, mobile solution to replace paper-based tasks that your business might be currently using. Um, and then the third last point, recognize the importance of marketing in your, in your business online. Um, audit your business and understand where you're at. And then obviously create an action plan of the steps that you need to do to progress through to the next level. So ladies and gents, that brings the session today formally to an end. Um, I'd like to thank you all for, uh, for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, what, I, what I will do just quickly before we open up the chat uh, and the questions, if you have got questions, feel free to use the, uh, the question and answer panel here. We'll get to that in a moment, but I've, I've, if you have a quick look, um, I've popped up in the chat section there a link to SurveyMonkey, uh, and I'd encourage you just before you log off this afternoon, if you can quickly duck uh, into SurveyMonkey and, and just quickly r r rate how you thought today went. Uh, we'd love to hear your opinions, um, and I'll, I'll quickly open up for any questions. Um, and there's a couple of uh, couple of people that have asked some questions in here. Um, let me scroll down. Um, feel free to ask questions, guys, uh, and I'll, I'll get through some of this. Um, the chat facility doesn't work for some reason. Okay, so the chat facility is not working. Here we go. Let me put this up in the questions. I've just popped this survey link up there. Um, is there an example of a small business using online selling um, of the domino example cited? I'm not 100% certain what that is referring to. Is there an example of businesses using online selling? There's plenty of examples of, of businesses using um, online selling. There's lots of opportunities that businesses can generate from it. It might be everything from a business that sells costumes online right through to um, right through to a, a business like Domino selling pizzas and so forth online. You know, quite often, particularly from a B to C perspective, online selling works really, really well for the niche type businesses, uh, that, that style of, of operation, businesses that have a very, very specific niche product, um, you know, typically would sell quite well online. But as I said before, you know, consider not only B to C, so selling directly to consumers, um, you know, really look at for opportunities to sell to your suppliers um, via a B2B e-commerce type solution. Um, how do I send a question via chat? The question, you're actually using, Christine, the, um, the chat facility right now. Um, do you have an example of IAAS based in Australia? Um, great question. So infrastructure as a service. Yeah, there's plenty of examples of businesses that are utilising infrastructure as a service, Patricia. One of the, um, one of the, uh, I guess, one key business which has come, uh, received a whole heap of accolades is uh, a company called New Steel Homes who've moved their entire operation. I think there's actually a case study in the workbook. Actually, I know there's a case study in the workbook that you can have a quick look at. Um, but they've moved their entire business to a, uh, a, a cloud-based solution and receiving some really positive um, gains. But there's some, there's some providers in Australia that you can have a quick look at to, uh, to, to, that are experts, again, in providing um, infrastructure as a service-based solutions. There's a company in Brisbane called Divest IT, but also Amazon Web Services, they offer uh, infrastructure as a service type solutions. Um, yeah feel free to ask any more questions and certainly I've sent 
my email address out yesterday to people so if there's anyone that has any specific questions that doesn't want to ask it here today feel free to email me. Um, what is the web address for the workbook you mentioned? Um, Ray, I'll send an email around at the end of today's session and I'll forward it with I'll send it to everyone with another link to the uh, to the Dropbox uh, link for the for the workbook. Ladies and gents, uh, here we go, one more. Um, you say that cloud computing has become 99% safe. Is that under optimal conditions? Um, and what are then optimal conditions? What kind of expertise do we need to achieve 99% safety on, on the cloud? Christine, typically um, security on, from the cloud is provided by the cloud provider itself. Um, typically cloud solutions are held in, in high level, highly secure um, data centres. These data centres are typically in locations which are flood proof and um, you know, cyclone proof and, and so forth. So, you know, all these different elements make up security. Um, it, it, there's, there's, again, like if we, if we go back to um, some of the local providers, and I mentioned before a company called Divest IT, they actually run data, data warehouse tours where you can go and physically be and, and see and experience the data center where your data would be, would be um, stored and saved. And you can go through the security processes to physically get to that data. Most of it is, is, is kind of almost um, a little bit matrix style in some ways. It's, it's fingerprint scan and, and retina scan and so forth to have access to these, these facilities. It's quite incredible. Um, I'd encourage you to go and have a quick look at, um, you know, a, again, maybe research a little bit further into the security on the cloud in many ways. Um, what f-commerce platforms are available? Great, great question. F-commerce is um, is essentially is so again f-commerce is Facebook commerce. The way in which Facebook works is Facebook works by the provision of um, allowing a developer to be a developer to be able to create a website within the Facebook tool. So, for instance, a PHP is a, is a language that um, that that web developers would use to create you know web applications and so forth. They can create an an of PHP driven e-commerce store within the Facebook parameters. So you don't physically need to go and buy any new software. Your, your web developer that currently manages your e-commerce solution might be able to, uh, might be able to create something um, for you and, and embed it within your Facebook page. Um, is there security concern for having financial information in the cloud? Patricia, yeah, there is. There's always going to be a security concern for storing any information in the cloud, whether it be uh, financial data or, or you know, just standard business intelligence and so forth. Um, I'd really encourage you to go and have a look at some of the, uh, some of the, the major and, and more significant um, cloud accounting solution providers. And you might want to have a quick look at Xero, X-E-R-O. I'll pop it up in the uh, in, in the in the, the questions here just quickly. Oh no, for some reason I'm not able to. Um, but it's xero.com um, or FreshBooks, F-R-E-S-H-B-O-O-K-S dot com. Um, you might want to have a quick look at that, and, and you can see a little bit more information about the security measures that they've got in uh, in their operations. Um, a question from Patricia, how dependent are these digital tools to internet speed? Yeah, it, it does all come back to internet and the quality of the internet connection. So, I mean, with the, the rollout of NBN in Australia, you know, we'll start to see increases in, in, um, in internet speeds. Um, but, you know, the 4G network that, that's been released by the mobile telcos, um, which will be, you know, rolled out across the country and across the state over the next couple of years, uh, it will it, it is sufficient and it is high it is classed as high speed internet um, so there's advantages going through these you don't need to necessarily have specifically you know super fast high speed internet connections the faster however the better typically ladies and gents we might um we might do any, one more question is there any more questions that anyone's got um None at this point. Well, listen, ladies and gents, thank you very much for uh, for participating again today. Um, really appreciate your time. Um, again, I encourage you if, you, if you're happy to quickly fill in the uh, the survey before you log off this afternoon, that'd be greatly appreciated. Again, I've sent you an email um, with with obviously my contact details, but more implicitly the uh, workbook link. Feel free to download the workbook and feel free to send me an email if you'd like any more information on this and I might be able to link you in with uh, some people that are, that are providers in this space. Ladies and gents, on behalf of the Department of Tourism, Major Events, Small Business and the Commonwealth Games, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Much appreciated. Thank you.